I mean, take a look at that. You can definitely see a secondary sun there. So do you think that's lens flare? Is that a sun dog? Clay pigeon? Concentrated swamp gas? Is that Project Blue Beam? Are they just trying to mess with our minds with holographic technology? I don't know. But it's pretty darn cool nonetheless. Now, Jason is going to describe to us the information he's compiled of what he feels is the orbit of Nibiru, Wormwood, Planet X, the Red Kachina, the Winged Destroyer. Now, he's got texts and data not only from the, the Hebrew version of the Bible, but also texts from China and South Pacific. So he's going to bring together a plethora of intel for us. And also, towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to show you some recent photographs that were sent to me by somebody of the name of Jason as well that lives in California. Some of the best photographic evidence that I have seen to date of a second sun. So stay tuned, folks. And remember, we actually had a disconnection situation twice. We were disconnected twice during the beginning of the Skype call, and we've kind of had to put it back together. So we'll continue where we left off. Stay safe and be the change you want to see. We've been disconnected now twice, ladies and gentlemen, and Jason's been able to get back on with us. Now, the first time we got disconnected, what happened was when he logged back on, his hotspot had a different name, and it also said that you were shut down for until 6 a.m., right, Jason? Yeah. Okay. I called Comcast, and they said I was shut down until 6 a.m. in my area. And okay. now it still says I'm connected to number two for whatever reason. And you don't have a, a number two, you said? No. <laughs> That's Not really weird. Yeah. Now, for those who have heard of Project Stingray, there's certain technologies out there that can spoof either cell phone towers or Wi-Fi spots, so the person that puts those up can actually get all the information that's transferred to and from that specific area. Now, I don't know who's listening to these conversations or why, but this is very strange indeed because this is the second time we've had to upload this, and it's not like we're talking about anything that's you know, classified, so this is very strange. Now, this chart that you've put together, Jason, I think this is very interesting because when we got disconnected before, what we brought up was the approximate 360-year timeline where these cataclysms take place about every 360 years. And this correlates with Gil Brassard's work, where, as I said before, he's taken texts and information from all over the globe, even, you know, Asia, and it talks about how these catastrophes happen approximately every 360 years. So walk us through the information that you've put together, if you would. Well, you get a chronological order. I'll go ahead and start with that and just do my own pointer up because I forgot to add two into this one. But uh, you got Noah's flood, and I'll just do this breakdown of this real quick. And after that, you had 364 years after that, between that and the Tower of Babel with Sodom and Gomorrah, which was 2016 B.C. And then after that, you have um, Joseph of Egypt, which is the second recorded biblical pole shift, I believe, in 1793. And that was 192 years. And then we can go to this chart back here again. Let me see this one. Yeah, so then you have the Exodus of Egypt, which is 1518 B.C., and then 52 years between. And that, I believe, is because at the same time, uh, we believe something hit the planet Ceres and destroyed it and uh, basically made a third of the asteroid belt. And uh, I'll bring up a picture right, real quick to kind of correlate with that should be at the bottom of my thing. Yeah, right here. Um, there's the asteroid belt. There's Ceres in orbit. And this shows you where their distance from the sun is. It's directly between Mars and Jupiter. So um, if something passed between Mars and Jupiter, it would have hit that if it was, you know, lined up right. And that's why the asteroid belt in Ceres is there. Ceres is a third of the size. It looks almost like an asteroid. It's uneven. And then... Uh, They've confirmed that about a third of the material in the asteroid belt's made up of it. So that's another compelling thing. So that's why the orbit could have been slowed down to 52 years. And I have another uh, little diagram here to kind of show that. Just in a basic, quick way, you have a 
the object would have hit something, made a 52-year orbit, and then the next time it would have came out in 131 and 336, and then finally get into its normal orbit again. We do this with satellites and all kinds of things. It's a slingshot te technique. We just okay. use gravity. Um, just basic. Uh, people can look that up, and they know all about that. So just gave a basic diagram. Um, and we'll go back. And then you can see, like I said, Joshua's long day, third recorded pole shift. Uh, there was like a 16-hour day right there, or 12-hour day. Um, I'll go back into this all in detail, like I said. Uh, 130 year, one years between things. Job's troubles, he had uh, meteorites and crazy stuff happen then. 336, uh, King David and King Saul, they had plagues and people dying and just uh, lots of things going on, destruction at that time too. Uh, 360, Jonah warns of this thing coming in. They see a big red thing in the sky that was 50 times the moon, basically, the way they're like describing it. And the Hosekia sundial, that's when the sun went down the steps 10 steps and went back up the steps and then back down the steps 10 steps, the shadow. Uh, 352 years after that, the second temple of a guy... Um, We'll go in more into that later here in a minute. Uh, 362 years later, Jesus dies, and the sun's blocked out for three hours, if you guys remember, before the Feast of Passover, which is a full moon and can't be a lunar eclipse. So, or a solar eclipse from the moon, if we have a full moon. Um, now, you put a graph together on that too, didn't you, to show yeah, that? I, yeah, I could show that. I thought that was pretty interesting, because that puts a, a reference point on it for people to look at. Yeah, there it so, is. It says, now from the sixth hour of darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, on Passover, it's celebrated uh, on a full moon. Jesus was sacrificed on the eve of Passover. So the moon isn't physically involved in this at all. You know, it can't be. and Because uh, you can't have a full moon and have it eclipse the sun. That makes no sense. You know, that's the light source that's making the full moon full, full, so it can't block it out from our perception. It just makes no sense at all. Um, the shadow, So you would have another object, so i just call it Nibiru, put it in front of the sun, and then you'd see how the shadows would affect from our perception. You'd get one curved around this way and one curved around that way. So you have a three-hour dark spot here at about that size, and, you know, it's not all actual size. But that's why the moon would turn blood red, like they reference in the Bible, and the sun would be blocked out. Because this object's big enough and close enough to block out the sun from our perception. And it, it'd obviously be bigger and probably closer to us, you know. And this is just for reference to fit on paper. And uh, I just put on there, you know, kind of about the artifacts, about the Nebra sky disk and things like that. So um, we can go back to the other graph here again. So, Jesus was sacrificed, and there you go. 284 years later, Constantine sees a cross in the sky and uh, says, Go forth and conquer in this symbol, you know, like something like that. It's in Latin. I can go uh, show you my references in a moment. But, yeah, he sees a giant cross in the sky above the sun. Uh, 395 years later, uh, there's a mine drought we see and the end of their civilization, basically. Um, 347 years later, we got the Chinese guest star, which was visible for about six, almost 700 days and 23 days in the daytime. Um, at one point, it actually became uh, bigger than the moon in our sky. Now, where did you get that information then? This is all, you can look all this up right on Wikipedia, any of it. You can look this all up. I mean, it's it's all there. You can read, uh, just correlate this all with events that happened in real life and in the Bible from you just start with what, what do we know that says it happens then and correlate the times and then you correlate the times with what we have with artifacts all the research that's always been done on this thing for what 80 20 some it's the 20s you know you got people their theories YouTube videos references like just everything is you get pointed and led in the right direction you look you find out it checks out you, you write it down, you can jot it down and just put the notes and go from there. That's why I'm, I'm giving reference points to all these things so everybody can look it up, 
read more into it yourself and come to their own conclusions, you know, see if these events were even correlated or related at all, you know. I'm just putting that that there's obvious things happening every so so often, you know. And I may be doing it in my benefit, you know, to kinda maybe I'm seeing a pattern that's not there, you know. I don't know. But um the Chinese guest star, that's the really big one because it's a supernova that was seen in our sky for 700 years, or for 700 days almost, and 23 in the daytime, it became bigger than the moon. It, uh, they, they have a prophecy over in China that when you know something like that appears in the sun or in the sky that it's like a soul visiting and leaving, you know, and it was really spiritual to them because it was yellow at one point and then it became red and whitish and, you know, it was... Uh, it was actually a book and a paper writ on, written on it by a guy named Lang Fang Ho or something like that. Uh, I can look into that for you in a moment if you'd like it. But it's called um, The Chinese Guest Star and the Creation of the Crab Nebula. Well, and I know I, Gil Brassard talks a lot about that, too. Yes, that's a very big, uh, very, very big point in astronomy. Like, um, it's been, it's actually taught in uh, school, you know, and like when, when you teach astronomy class. Because it was unidentified and we don't know what it was. So the, they depicted things from their viewpoint. From, they measured things with reference points, like I'm here, there's this reference point. So they looked at things from the same point every day and you know, chart, charted the stars and things that came in the sky. And they were very spiritual about it, but Chinese records go back further than anybody's. You know what I mean? They're basically the, the first real written records other than uh, you know, when we go back into Sumerian and the biblical stuff, which is, um, has literal and figurative translations and all kinds of stuff you know it's been you have know you've seen those temples that have petroglyphs that show and also carvings that have dinosaurs next to people yeah there's uh, all kinds of stuff like that yeah i've seen those uh, a lot of them are i believe to be like uh native americans or something i guess wasn't that, was that oh no no that's way i mean we're talking stuff in you know, kind of South Pacific area. And then, you know, here's the thing about history is it rewrites itself all the time. Yes. They find so many strange, what I call ooh parts, or just things that shouldn't be there that are out of time, out of genre. And then you're like, wow, how did that get there? That just doesn't make any sense. But then if you look at the possibilities of different cycles, different timelines, you know, maybe we have been here for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. I mean, they've got footprints in stone literally next to dinosaur prints. And if you look at some of the anomalies where they've got, I don't know if you've heard of Michael Cremo, he's got an entire book, it's about 800 pages called Forbidden Archaeology, where they found tools and artifacts that are over a million years old. I mean, it's just totally strange. Yeah, so. yeah. like it's almost, um, and they're not supposed to be there, like... Uh, in like they're inlaid in the rock and stuff, and they don't know how to get there. Right. The get there, um, see, there's a lot of theories on that. Actually, like uh, like they shared a, a space and time for a moment. Um, if you do the math, like E equals M C squared and E equals T, and all those theories they have out there about you know energy, um, the math shows that two pieces of matter could physically show share the same. Pace, you know, place and time, but mm -hmm. not, you know, touch because, you know, how matter is. Well, so, and another thing, too, and I just want to interject this real quick if I can, because I've often wondered if there's been this reset that just continually, every several hundred years, whenever a uh, civilization gets too much power and influence and doesn't keep balance and harmony within the world for whatever reason, maybe this reset could possibly be planet X. Yeah, there, it's it's like a natural way. Like uh, when you look at you know our universe and our solar system in particular, a lot of things stand out and shouldn't be there. Like NASA themselves said, it'd be easier to explain the moon isn't there than it would be to explain it is because of how it perfectly blocks out the sun and mm -hmm. its rotation always facing us like a satellite dish. Um, it it just doesn't make sense. So a lot of it's too perfect. It's almost like uh, something sets something up that it, it almost is like a self cleansing. Uh, fish tank, you know, <laughs> you could say, uh, yeah, and, uh, and and it's always around the math. Like I said, the 360. Uh, our Earth used to go around a 360-day orbit, and the calendars show that. Um, 
it would just make sense that, you know, you go metric from there and things with size get bigger and, you know, something bigger that has maybe another sun, a binary sun, would have this eccentric orbit. And a lot of the comets actually share the same orbit that I believe this has. So that would uh, make a lot of sense to me, you know. Some of these debris, you know, just kind of lost their way, but get, still get pulled around, you know, mm -hmm. by it and by the, our sun and just the force of the universe. Certainly. Now, what are we looking at here? Yeah, this would be the, the first thing they talk about in the, the, the Bible that um, people survived. You know, I guess there's a flood that uh, nobody survived, they talk about. But this is Noah's flood, and we can kind of date that with the artifacts and the time and you know, a lot, of, a lot of things, but the professionals say, and you guys can look this up, that Noah's Flood happened around 239, or 2,349 B.C. And I believe that that's around, they describe, you know, a pole shift there because of a couple particular things that happened. Um, and I'll just load, I read a list of facts there. It says, facts from the Bible. It said it rained for 40 days. The water was high for 150 days. And then they, the boat rested after that. And then about 253 days, they seen tops of the mountains come down. So the water started to come down. 300, day, 300 days, they found land. They, you know, it was like floodlands. And then 314 days, um, the water dried up. And 370, you had uh, about a year later, you had plants and stuff back. So that's what it tells us in the Bible. And um, I just drew a little diagram. When it talks about the things that happened 150 days and if you look at the orbits of the the cycle there and how it would cross it would be about five months which is 150 days between intersections on the earth's orbit so if it had comets and debris trails and water that wasn't you know of this earth and it drug it through it would be coming in you know just say it's coming in this way all right and the earth's coming in this way so uh, for the purpose of this diagram, I drew a, a brown side and a green side. So as Noah was coming through, you'd have to be on the nighttime side to be safe, you know, or the meteorites would have get him, got him. So he comes through, and, you know, like I said, this side, because of the debris coming around, the debris would be coming towards Nibiru, all right? So the nighttime side, the side away from the sun at this point, would be, you know, safe. And then as it crosses through... You know, the 150 days because, you know, you're you're in between the orbit still, you know, the meteor trail and the debris, debris trail. So you hit, as you get up here a little ways, the green side starts to get hit by it on the other side because the debris trail is going um, right to left. And uh, so the daytime side would actually be safe at that point. So there's a good indicator that uh, we had a, a, at least somewhat of a pole shift if... Um, you know, nighttime and daytime sides and, you know, boats and things like that. Uh, you know, he was on opposite sides of the world 150 days later, probably uh, maybe at the same time, you know. But uh, sure. a, a mark that Passover literally marks the date, you know, because it, it seems that Passover literally is talking about this object. And it seems like they edited that out of the Bible, you know, or maybe that was in the Bible code with the numbers, you know, and we're not seeing it because we didn't. We weren't, you know, speaking the ancient language, so. Okay. Uh, uh, just got yeah, some um, Bible verses there, Genesis nineteen twenty-three, and it just uh, this was about Sodom and Gomorrah. This was the next part, um, three hundred and sixty-four years later. So the sun had risen. Um, the Lord rained so, uh, brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah, basically. And he overthrew those cities and the inhabitants of the cities and burned what was on the ground. And when this guy turned around and looked back, she became a pillar of salt. It, it, uh, a lot of people translate that and say that it was almost like a nuclear flash almost. Like right. When you look at Hiroshima. Um, said, now Abraham arose early in the morning and went to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked down at Sodom and Gomorrah in the land and it smoked like a furnace. And then there's 192 years later... Um, another polar shift there, you could say, because of the, the evidences in the land, uh, the, the astro, the astrological, the, sorry, astrological records at the time and the diagrams they pitch, they picture and where they drew them from in reference point 
is actually shifted, um, I believe, 26, 28 degrees at that point. Uh, the constellations shouldn't have been seen in the sky and things like that when they had uh, their depictions. And it kind of just shows this through the charts that, you know, and we all know this, and they tell you this in class, that a shift can happen gradually or real fast over time, you know. But 28 degrees, it's a gradual thing, and we know it's uh, we know the Earth is tilted at about that. That's what gives us the seasons, you know. So it's just something more to think about. But the pole shift really wouldn't be, um, you know, too catastrophic if it was that that slow, you know what I mean? It would be the meteor showers and the stress that if this thing was close enough that time, that the stress that you you know on the plates. So, you know, one thing that's interesting to think about is if there is a way to because there was a couple Caltech professors or I don't know if they're professors, but some people with Caltech that actually said they found a planet nine. They call it the ninth planet in between yeah. Jupiter and Saturn. Now, if it's there right now, if they can figure out what size it is and then, OK, so how long would it take to get from there to wherever it's going, whether that be the, you know, is it, how close is it actually going to get to Earth? And if we know its reference point, then, see, I'm not a, an astronomer. I'm just a reporter. Is there a way to, okay, we're going to look at this part of the sky. We're going to record at a certain time of day, and that's going to give us our best shot to pick up this planet X. Okay, well, that's, well, yeah, uh, basically, if you look at this, this, um, I can even pull up the chart for today if you wanted. I think I have it up here. That'd be great. Right there. There's the planets right now. Um, you can so you can overlay, I guess, my chart on top of that if we could. Let me minimize this. Kind of. Nah, 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 nah. Oh. There we go. So we can look at it and see that this is what I was talking about. This is the placement. So they're talking about the the astronomical units. They're not meaning literally. It might not be between Saturn and Jupiter, like right here. It could be just in between these the space anywhere on this circle you know okay so okay and that that actually correlates with everything everybody's been telling us because I mean if you look at about where I drew it for right now that's basically where I said it was gonna be you know what I mean and uh, April 23rd I believe uh, Passover this year between now and Passover 2017 is my estimate of when it'll cross Earth orbit the first time and I believe 150 days after that, just about. So, you know, September 23rd, I guess, something like that would, would be uh, the, maybe that. I can't remember the exact date, but that there'd be t those two paths. So that would be the day the Earth, you know, about six days after that, where on these, according to these charts, we would be coming right into that first debris trail right here about six days after Passover. So if that's the case, we'd be hitting a pretty rugged meteor shower on the daytime side of the Earth. And uh, the, the exit point on September next year would be right, right when we were talking about um, the, uh, the other alignment. If you look at this whole chart and everything, okay. it, would even, it would even make sense, um, the placement of the dragon in the sky and the alignment of Earth and Jupiter and all that with... Uh, you know, Virgo and all that in the uh -huh. sky. It would just, we'd be, September, I believe, around here somewhere. Virgo would be here. Uh, the planet would be here. So Jupiter would be right here. And, yeah, it would all line up, you know. It would just, just the way we were talking about it and showed you with the chart. But this object's even coming in. And the information that NASA's has given us correlates with this. And if they're kind of solidifying that it's there for us, you know, they're they're letting us know. They're not telling us that it's on the approach um, crossing orbits, you know what I mean? And when you look at this, I think, uh, let me show you right here. I got it up. So if I pull up the comets. All right, so if you look at where the comets are there, um, and that actually makes sense that there would be another sun, uh, you know, somewhere probably to the right, I'd say, in our perception of North America where we are in orbit with the sun right now. I'd probably be to the right if it was filmed in North America, you know. And maybe, to, I'd say the south, you know, probably 26, you know, a couple degrees to the south and to the right, you know. And that'd just be my guess, you know. 
but uh, right here in the center of this, you can see how these comets concentrate this way. And uh, you know, like I said, that that little ball of ice. I mean, if people know about physics and stuff, what's what's making that little ball of ice come around and just swing around the sun and then go way back out here, but make a turn and come back in? There has to be something in the middle making it turn. You know what I mean? There has to be another orbit pulling it in. The sun's not gonna pull it in sharply way out here. You know, so. There's something in here, you know, perturbing and making these things orbit. So that also means there's objects out here, you know, near Leo and Aries. <laughs> you know, there's definitely a cluster and concentration over here, you know, um, of objects too. But mm -hmm. it all correlates the data, like I said, it just correlates with what we know and the facts. So, I mean, I made a diagram, like I said, so you could kind of see uh, where to be looking in the sky type stuff. And like I said, it, uh, my guess from the charts would be to the right of the sun, maybe below it, you know. So as the sun would rise, you know, um, it would kind of stay in the same spot of the sky possibly, you know what I mean, just depending on the curvature of, you know, what part of the, how high the sun is in the sky, you know, because of the curvature of the earth and that throws a lot of stuff off with the atmosphere and kind of refracts and makes things look bigger like I was telling you before like the those images those people think are you know huge planets in the, the solar system when they only see them on a camera you know mm -hmm. they didn't see it with their naked eye but they take a picture and they're like oh look at that huge planet it's like a photo you know like a projector you see in school well and another thing too is there was a photo that was presented to us here at the leak project where it looked like this giant red moon or planet or anomaly on a sky cam or it was actually not a sky cam it was just a webcam i think it was italy or something like that you know and this yeah. thing just looked huge and i'm thinking wow that's why is not why isn't everybody seeing that and then the you know many people would say well it's because of the the infrared or whatever well you know what i saw some other pictures after like like that kind of i think they were I think what happened was the person that sent me this picture either had access to the other ones and didn't want to send me the other ones with it, or he, he didn't get them until afterwards. But I actually got access to a few other photos that looked like they were taken just right after that specific shot, if you're keeping up with what I'm saying. Yeah. And you know what it was? It was a big freaking spider. Oh, yeah. It was a red spider. Because you, oh. you could see the legs over the lens. Yeah. And that and makes total sense, you know. Like the, yeah. So the one shot you're gonna get, you know, oh wow, that looks like a freaking red sun, it's and then red orb. <laughs> yeah, and then the next thing, it's got these freaking legs on it. You're like, wow, that's a big cosmic spider. No, yeah. it's a spider on the camera. Yeah. I mean, you gotta you gotta keep use your discretion, like you always say, you know, and stay neutral. Don't let us don't assume that it's fake. Don't assume that it's real research you know just look into it you yeah. know especially if it strikes you <laughs> you know that's why when people on your comments you know told me hey you kind of have you know a misunderstanding or this and that i didn't want to disrespect their religion and when i say i'm not religious that means i don't follow a religion i don't that doesn't mean i don't have a god or understand what maybe a god is to me or i'm not you know spiritual in any way that does not mean that you know absolutely that people assume what they want you know and uh I'm a truth seeker, so I'm not going to say, yes, this is my religion or this and that until I know the truth. When I find out the truth, then I'll, then I'll commit, okay? And that's all I can say, and that's my choice. So, Hey, um, good for you, man. Don't assimilate. Do what you feel is right. I think everybody's got their own path, whether you're a Christian yeah. or you're agnostic or you're atheist or you practice hermetics or you're a Muslim. It doesn't matter. I mean, it really what matters is... Where is your heart? Where is your conscience? Where is your essence, folks? What are your actions? That you know, what are your intentions? It doesn't really matter what color your skin is or what religion you practice. It's I, I read some of these comments where people think they're just high and mighty, yet they're so judgmental and they talk about how you need to be saved and they're the ones just judge you know, doesn't the Bible specifically say judge not and not be judged, essentially? Yeah, he's they're they're completely missing the message. It's almost like that's been planted there in their mind to actually follow the one thing that they're supposed to not. You know, it's almost like uh, 
Satan leads their church anymore, and I'm not saying that in a rude way, but just look at look at the obviousness, you know. Well, They're and look at in, like gold thrones over there, mm -hmm. you know, literally with children starving on the world. I'm pretty sure Jesus said to give all your possessions away and stuff like that. Be a man of God, not sit in the gold throne and let people starve, you know. But in million dollar churches, things like that. It's 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 they're subjecting you so your mind isn't open you know these books were here they just edited them so don't get the facts twisted try to read the facts you know and remember that hebrew language was their letters were their numbers so they had uh, things that you could call geometria or whatever like that it would mm -hmm. be an equation in numbers and letters and that's why i get that's where i get these numbers a lot of the numbers that i get are actual numbers in the hebrew language and not written out in letters, okay? They specifically designated them as letters or numbers instead of letters. Like I showed you in the last video, they'd say, they'd spell out 7, 12, this, that. But when they came to 1026, you know, they spelled out 1026, you know? And I believe, you know, April 23rd is the beginning of that. Um, Passover next year is the beginning of that, you know, 126 days, maybe six days after. So maybe April 30th. Um, we should maybe have a meteor storm. That's something to look out for. There's like these are definite timelines because of the numbers there. I'm just saying, if if any of it's real and it was doing this stuff, that that that's when we'd see it. We'd see it April of next year. We'd have a meteor storm. Uh, possibly this September, if it if it crosses earlier, then you know if it if it crosses just a little bit earlier, you know what I mean? Maybe September's the entry, entry point and April's the exit, you know, or vice versa, April's the entry and September's the exit. We don't know, but that'd be 150 days about, and that's just my guess, you know, like I said. Uh, but it's all based on numbers and a lot of math and a lot of people's guesses too, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Everybody out here has been sharing their information and translating their texts, and, you know, the Internet's a, a crazy thing. So, you, you know, in the age of information, ignorance is a choice, like they say. So. Oh, yeah. And that's a, that's another thing I guess we need to to let our. Well, you know what? I don't even think that we need to give any more attention to these people out there that are leaving the majority of these comments, because I've noticed there's a few people in particular that are trying to stir the pot. And I think there's a few professionals out there that are literally trying to push people's buttons to get them to go after them to where they can take it and use it against them. There is actually a guy that was pushing the buttons of one of our listeners on a specific... And here's another thing that I find fascinating, Jason, is the, the Planet X videos get attacked more than anything. I mean, whether it's a 9-11 video or something on any other subject, it seems like this one in particular just gets nailed. It gets attacked, and it's, it's very interesting. But there's a few people in particular that I've been keeping my eye on that they're really good, you know? I mean, they'll, they'll use yeah. certain verbiages and, and key words... And you can tell they know what they're doing. They're like paid provocateurs or provocateurs. Yeah. So be careful, guys, because they'll spin you and then they'll take that information and use it against you. And if you go back and retaliate by making a stupid comment, like there was somebody that posted just a stupid comment on the channel and I took it down as soon as I saw it. But the person he sent the comment to was trying to get that type of response out of him. And then he goes back and says, hey, I'm going to take this information and send it in to the, you know, to, to Big Brother. So have fun in, in Nazi California is essentially what he said. And it's like, man, you got to be real careful out there. Yeah, that's that's yeah. why I've thought before, maybe I should just take these comment sections down. But it seems like when I do that, the, you know, people send me a bunch of emails saying, hey, we, we want to see what people have to say about this. So I do my best to just keep it as civil as possible so keep it civil folks yeah that's that's i mean anybody that's claiming that they're like awakened and this and that and you're being smug at the same time that's like the first indicator that you're truly not awakened and you know not what you you're speaking of so you know don't take advice from a fool and don't let these people manipulate you into thinking any other way just like don't let me manipulate and into thinking any other way just i'm i'm presenting you information that I've looked up and you can make your own assumptions you know exactly make your own decision folks that's what the leak project was designed for uh, question what, everything there's it's it's news that, that people don't want to talk about <laughs> <laughs> exactly so the pick up where we left off there uh, 275 years after uh, 
that, um, where were we? The Joseph of Egypt, the things we were talking about. It was a, well, I'll, I'll get more into that actually. So Joseph of Egypt had a plague, seven years of, you know, famine and drought and all this stuff. And then they had, uh, somebody had a dream. This was Genesis 37, 9. Then he had another dream and he told his brothers, listen, uh, the dream, this time the sun, the moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And that's the actual first time they talk about the moon. So I thought that was something key to touch on to. Um, never, they never talked about the moon in the Bible until that point. So uh, there you go. Um, 275 years later, Exodus of Egypt, 1518 BC, partial creation of the asteroid belt, like I showed you. Um, it slowed its speed about 20 times, making it a 52-year rotation. I showed you that. Just like satellites, they don't go out as far if they don't have as much energy because the sun pulls them back. And that's just how it is. And that's why I believe that we had the three days of darkness or whatever it was. Uh, I'll get to it right here. The plague of darkness. Uh, Stretch out your hand towards the sky, the Lord said to Moses. And so darkness spreads over Egypt, darkness that can be felt. So he stretched out his hand and darkness covered Egypt for three days. But uh, Israel had light for three days. Um, Says that, I mean plain as day. <laughs> so that means the Earth's rotation stopped for three days for whatever reason. And that would be because if something came that close, we'd actually be in the plasma field of that big object as it's roaring through space, you know. And then we would kind of be considered like part of that object as we're going, as it's going by, you know. So we would lose our rotation. We would start spinning as fast as it does. You know, it'd kind of be a dead zone for us. And then uh, that's, I mean, it's, that can be scientifically proven. I mean, it's just the idea of the debris trail behind it or a comet or anything. Um, then Joshua's long day, that's uh, 52 years after. Um, third recorded pole shift because uh, I wrote some facts down. We look, can look historically and see that 350,000 men army gathered in 1455 B.C. So that's 11 years before this, Okay. And we can look that up historically and see the Assyrian army had that many men at that time. Okay? Not biblically. So there's 11 years difference. Uh, Nibiru, they, they said something appeared 50 times in the sky. You know, it was like uh, seen this big thing in the sky, you know. And the kings of the enemies hidden caves. And uh, their rotation slowed for Israel. It slowed, so Israel had a longer day and China had a longer night. And uh, if you look at the Chinese records, the Chinese, they said that they recorded as a long night. You can look that up on Wikipedia, the long night, Chinese, whatever, uh, history books. And Passover correlates with this again. Um, two to three hours after that, a meteor shower happened in the Bible that discusses it. And uh, I believe the pole was shifted again around that time, pulled, just twisted a little bit, like I showed you with the glass diagram here. I'll show you again. this one right here see I believe it's coming in at a slight angle underneath and just giving us a tug and spinning the earth just a little bit as it comes around so that's why you know we have our tilt I believe you know and where the the, the minor pole shifts are coming from every uh, every about four times this comes through maybe every couple thousand years you know and you can look back in the magnetic uh, information in the lava and see that too so, like I said, all this stuff you guys can look up on yourself. I'm just giving you starts, you know, places places to look and maybe see. Tell mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong and, you know, kind of help us correlate all this data because it's a lot, <laughs> a lot of stuff. And after that, they fled Israel down, I'll read the Joshua 10:11. As they fled down the road before Beth Horon and Ezekiel, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them. More of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords. And then uh, 130 years, 131 years later, I, I forgot to touch on something. I per, put it up here. I put it actually later. But uh, there's, it shows that the Lord struck 150,000 of these people dead in the uh, army. Um, they woke up dead or whatever from, you know, struck them with meteorites. And uh, apparently that army was destroyed around that same time. Um, historically, like I said, that, that, that many men were there, and historically, 
Uh, about half of them died mm -hmm. <laughs> a couple years later. So okay, look that up. The Assyrians. Um, 131 years later, we called it Job's troubles or whatever you want to call it in the Bible. There, his the Book of Job, his message. But all kinds of stuff were happening, like the donkeys and there were they were uh, people were attacking. It was like total chaos and anarchy. Donkey, donkey. But uh, the Chaldeans and camels, they were uh, they were all. The crops were getting destroyed. People, the winds. Uh, it says the four corners of the house were not, were struck with wind, and it collapsed. And there was rocks falling from the sky. All kinds of stuff. Uh, Three hundred thirty-six years later, you had King Saul, and King David, and they had uh, the Lord smite them with famine and disease and stuff like that. And uh, if you think about it, if these things are bringing, you know. Um, space debris and things like that especially comets you know we we call them like a stream of files or whatever they can live in the upper atmosphere and actually transition like the seeding theory you know that's where maybe some of these famines and plagues pop up from you know they could literally just come from you know we're not used to it because we're not immune you know and it'd just be a simple organism really you know it could be anything common cold you know but uh or mold, even, you know, just mold that kills our plants because they're not used to it. Um, I went another one. Uh, he got to, uh, said he got to choose between, you know, being attacked by his enemy for three days or, or, yeah, three days or three months of famine or, yeah, what what was it? Three years of famine Three months of being swept away by your enemies, or three days of the sword of the Lord. And he chose uh, the God, you know, because he thought God would be, you know, merciful or whatever in that sense. But that shows you another plague and bad things, you know, like struck around, you know, that time. So it's just the Bible's telling us this. Uh, let me see here. Seven years of drought. And, you know, a lot of bad things happen then. So, I mean, that could show you, you know, possible pole shift or something getting close. And, like I said, they had plagues and uh, the wrath of God, whatever that is. You know, um, the meteorites, they talk about that a lot. So they could be figurative or realistic. I don't know. Uh, 358 years later, it's almost to its natural orbit again. I said that's the magic number in nature. You see 360 a lot. Uh, Jonah's warning. He actually... That's the destruction of the Assyrian army. I wrote it there in the Hezekiah sundial. Um, it said, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord, and he went to Nineveh. Nineveh was a large city. It took three days to go through it. Uh, took a day going through the city, saying, 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. And then they, they believed him, and they fasted, and they put on sackcloth. They prepared, basically. Okay? So they saved their food and all that. And the rich people even, you know, did it. So... 40 days would be, you know, a good heads up for seeing this thing come. You know, about 40 days you would start seeing it and you'd start seeing it get big, especially if they're not chemtrailing the sky and trying to obstruct your view with, you know, God knows what technology or whatever, you know. Um, we understand Chemtrails are for conspiracy theorists, dude. They're not real. Yeah, I see them every day, though. No, they're, they're, just, they're, just can, they're just sky. contrails, man. They, you don't know what you're talking about. It's swamp gas. Northwestern sky. Usually, yeah. <laughs> Northwestern part of the sky. Usually maybe northeast of the sun. It's kind of... I mean, all those X patterns, you know, and all those checkerboards, man. It's if you're, it's there. not real, okay? I mean, it's just... It's con it's concentrated swamp gas, and it's... it's I don't know. It's That's what it is. Well, we, we know we can't see the stars in the daytime, right? But when, as soon as the sun goes down, we can see them. So that's... It's weird how that works, isn't it? Yeah, it's photoionization. We're seeing, you know, the air, the atmosphere. So understand that if they just fog up the atmosphere a little bit, you wouldn't see things that are a little bit behind the sun. Okay, it would be like if I'm holding a flashlight in your face and at, and holding my fingers up behind the flashlight and asking you how many fingers I'm holding up, you're not gonna be able to tell. Okay, or I'll tell you to catch a ball while I'm holding a flashlight in your face. That's what we're doing. So I mean, it's working in their benefactor that it's behind the sun, you know, because the sun's very bright. So, um, block out the sun, I guess, and try to see it any way that you can, you know, would be the best way, maybe. And like I said, I think it'd be to below it and to the right, mm -hmm. if you're in North America. Uh, that, that goes for the opposite, anywhere below the southern hemisphere. So, you got to remember, you'd be standing upside down on the globe, and your perception would be flipped. So, 
I'm saying it would, if you're in Australia, it would be above and to the left, possibly. Okay. <clears throat> so, all right, we're going on. And it says... Yeah, so he would have seen this thing in the sky for 40 days and then, uh, you know, kind of warned them about it. So they just prepared and, you know, like they always say, they went into the mountains, this and that. And uh, but This is another part that was really, I thought, noticeable. It's Matthew 16, verse 3 through 4. And in the morning today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of a sky, but cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given except the sign of Jonah. Jesus left and went away. So he was, Jonah was the crazy guy talking about Nibiru, saying, hey, man, 40 days, this thing, you know, we got to prepare. And the rich people even did it. Everybody listened because they could see it, obviously, in the sky is what I'm guessing. Um, and he said, I will make the shadow cast to the sun go back. Ten steps has gone down the stair of Ahaz, so the sunlight went back ten steps. And then you can look another verse, Kings 34, 35, 19, 34, 35. I will defend the city and save it uh, for the sake of David. Um, that night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, they were all dead bodies. So they smited them with like uh, fire and stuff and rocks and there's biblical, uh, I guess, like meteor storm or whatever it was. Uh, then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death. You know, I just kind of recited. I must have doubled it there. 352 years later, um, these people build a temple for themselves and uh, not, I guess, a church or whatever is what the God, God was saying in it. And so he destroyed their crops and their building and their fields and their mountains and everything so uh basically so they worked for nothing and that was the way it said and it said i'll shake the heavens the earth the sea and the dry lands i'll shake the nations and what is desired by all nations will come i'll fill this house with glory and uh yeah 362 years later, it's almost 360 again, so it went undisturbed. That's when uh, the day before Jesus died, so we can go back up to that graph at the top again. There. So Jesus knew from about 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock, the sun was blocked out. But this, like I said, they celebrate Passover on a full moon, and Jesus was sacrificed on a full moon. So that just shows you that the moon was not the object blocking out the sun. It's impossible it's just impossible, and that's, there you go. So, even God, or Jesus, thought he was forsaken by God, you know, at that moment. So, that, that goes to show you that maybe God was a word, or a euphemism, or something, you know, maybe nature, or words unexplained, or, I don't know, in the Christian Bible, I can't tell you, but I the, know that God... The name God, the actual definition of God, if you look back a long ways, is unknown. Unknown. See, that's that's what I was thinking. Like uh, nature, a force of nature, something unknown. Um, all that is, you know, it's like when you take a, a a piece of quartz or crystal and you smash it up and you look at it through a, a telescope or, or what are, what are they called? You know what I mean? Kaleidoscope. Yeah. They, no. <laughs> <laughs> a little uh, magnifying you know, a glass. Microscope. A microscope. Microscope. You'll see that on the, the particles look the same. They're literally the same as the big image. And they even have like the same piezoelectric properties as the bigger piece, but on proportion to their scale. So when you add all those pieces together, they have more energy. And, you know, just it's that that in my mind is God. That is the collective consciousness. You know, that is everybody's and everything and the energy and what we all, you know, cycle through us, you know, whether it be through food or the sun or, you know, whatever, that that whole consciousness, that would be God in my mind, that collected, you know, life, you know, that that in my mind would make sense and fit the bill. We're all so, fractals of God at some level. Yeah. So like basically when we're made in God's image, that's the same idea as what I was just giving you, you know, smash up that crystal or the same thing just on a smaller scale. And if we all came together and we all have that, you know, collective consciousness and stuff, then we could, you know, be godlike. If we all, imagine if we could all work in tandem and help each other, you know, what could get done, you know. 
and just I mean but then would all be like the Borg, you know? It'd be no, no fun. not all the same, <laughs> not all the same. I'm just joking. No, I don't mean that. You would have your own free flow and energy and be yourself, but just be connected, you know, and not hate each other. Not, you know what I mean? Embrace the difference. You know what I'm saying? You know, and connect because of the difference. Because I like and specify in this, and you like and specify in that. We come together. We have the skills of both of us because, you know, you did all that for your whole life and I did this in my whole life. Now multiply that by everybody in the world. Everybody can do what they want and be unique and be their self, but still, you know, be helpful. You know what I mean? It's, We're all that, individual droplets, yet at the same time a part of the same ocean. Yeah, that's exactly. When we're created in God's image, that's what I believe that was the euphemism for, you know. This was divine knowledge, you know, on a, a molecular level even, you know. They were talking about the cells, just like Sitchin gets into it better with that stuff. Like, um, you know, when they're talking about everything, you look at the, the universe and how it works and even how helium... And a and a human child evolves, you know what I mean? Like how hydrogen and helium and all that, like the elements evolve. And you look at a human child and the cells and how they reproduce, it's the same thing, you know? So, yes, like on a very large and a very small scale, we are all the same, you know? It's just what manifestation of that frequency of energy, you know what I mean? The holographic universe. And like, uh, that's why a lot of people say, like, energy equals time, like, Einstein was wrong, and that's why they teach that Einstein and not Tesla type stuff. They like, because it, good information, wrong conclusion. Like, like, you know, basically energy could manifest itself in any way, a form of matter and a form of time and a form of things like that. And that's how people could even solidly explain, you know, those artifacts and and you know appearing in random pieces of time. You know, you could, you could almost send like a rocket back into time you know what i mean if you had the right technology it might like end up in the like, 20s or something you know what i mean You're, like it, i i think that's completely possible because it, you know how space time works like i said i i believe that you could totally be in two places at the same time because of how time works i don't think it's curved i think it's linear you know but it's and that's just how it can work you know like on a graph you could have two things be there and be the different frequencies over top of each other, you know, radio waves and ultraviolet rays and all these things can be in the same place. They're just different frequencies, you know? I, I, I totally believe that. But anyways. Uh, <laughs> nice. So, but, uh... So right now we're going to the... Okay, you're on Kings 1934-35 and this is just basically, okay, 352 mm -hmm. years, you pulled past that. Yeah, where I'm getting down to here. That was... Okay. Jesus was crucified uh -huh. and then... Um, so I had that, the constant, and our 284 years later, Constantine sees a cross in the sky, 312 AD. Uh, if you guys want a reference, look up the Battle of Melvin Bridge. He saw a sun with a cross, and the phrase, in this sign you shall conquer Christianity, and that's, you know, a lot of weird stuff there, right? I mean, you go back uh -huh. to the demonic possessions and weird things like that, like, yeah, that's kind of odd that it appears and then in the bible it tells you I that think you a know, demon just spoke through you right there it was a Jason. demon <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 395 years later was the mine drought and the end of the mine empire 707 ad uh yeah it shows that there was a drought around their area around that time you know geographically you can look at the satellites and stuff like that and they disappeared so who knows i mean the Crab Nebula, though. The Chinese guest star and the creation of the Crab Nebula. That's that is a book in a paper written by Lang Ho. You, if you typed that in, the, you will get the full reference in the book and the paper written by the man that did it. Now, a lot of people thought it was wrong because he thought it was a supernova exploding and things like that. They, their interpretations of it were there was many and few and far between. But uh, you could see it for, I'll read it to you. Chinese astronomers watched, documented, and accounted what they saw for a star getting bigger and bigger in the sky, and it was visible for a total of 642 days. The last day it was recorded to be seen was April 6th, 1056 AD. It was visible in the daytime for 23 days. This too correlates with the Passover in the 360-year orbit. Um, yeah, you guys can look that up. Uh, that was the first time. I mean, that's a big event. I mean, a new star appearing in the sky, and it's, I mean, it was a couple times, 
It was fractions of the moon. They were measuring it with fractions of the moon, like half the moon, two, two times the moon, things like that. You know? So, I mean, that's a big event. It's mm-hmm. two years in the sky. Mm-hmm. You know? And they were really excited about that. I would be, too. And then you can go back and just see all the Renaissance paintings and things like that. But the, the timelines correlate with them. Um, you can go, you see, because it's a painting, you could imagine that it could have been done, you know, a couple years after. And maybe, you know. So if you add those two together, I think it even correlates. It could be a shortened orbit, though, because it would go back with it. Because about 320 years to now, you know. It would it would just make sense with the the way satellites and everything works when you're rotating around sun gaining, you know, force. Um, and then I'm going to a little timeline for the revelations just so we could go through. Well, I see that. on the first one that you put Osama bin Laden as the rider on the white horse. Because he had a bow. That see that that's why it, to me it seems like that's the what started it. And he said he had he was white. I mean, it had the white gowns and stuff like that. I feel like that symbolism stuck to me. And when they said a bow, he said he had a bow. Remember, Osama always walked with a stick, and we always depicted him with a stick. And that's what they meant about the bow. They didn't mean like a bow and arrow. They meant a bow like a stick, a staff. And that's so I wrote that. And that, if you, I mean, you want me to pull up Revelations, uh, Revelation 6 through 12, if you want. Well, I mean, that, I mean, you can if you want to, but I know what you're saying because I do remember when he was walking around, you know, showing his Al Qaeda buddies, at least in these propaganda films. Obviously, he's like, "Okay, yeah, yeah put the AK-47 around your back, and I want you to go across these monkey bars, and I'm going to time you with a stopwatch." Okay, go. I mean, it was just that's the kind of crap they were pushing down our throats, and I could totally tell they were prepping us for something because that's exactly. Do you remember that they were just force yeah. feeding it? Yeah. down people's throats. Yeah, there were home videos made in caves. Yeah, right, man. That guy was funded by the CIA in, like, the 80s. Like, we all documented. He was, like, shaking hands in our, like, headquarters and stuff, man. That's, like, he was our agent, you know? He was put there. It's like, uh, we're going to Swamp gas. You, think about it, man. We're going to give you guns, you know? And they're like, wow, but you got to do this for us. But then they don't realize it's like uh, Suicide Squad. You're just the fall guys, Okay. They didn't realize they were going to get like that, like be subjugated like this. You know what I mean? They made a deal with the devil, and now they're the bad guy, okay? They made this deal. What are they going to say? Yeah, we bought a bunch of terrorist equipment. So you're saying you're terrorists. Yeah, well, then you admitted to what they're claiming you are. You know what I mean? So we were did some terrorist acts to get some guns. I mean, yeah, but we didn't do this and that. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that was the sign. And the second seal was a rider on a red horse. I feel like that is, I prayed, I put three things. That was either the whole global terrorism outbreak with Osama bin Laden, the American presidency with Bush and Obama, or the Russian presidency, because, or in Korea, because it's all the red, right? The red symbolism. And he was given a, a big sword, a, a huge sword, it says. And uh, he was given power to cause war over the nations and make the nations fight and kill each other. Um, I believe that we're, you know, already went through those two seals. The third seal is the black seal of the black horse, and it, it carried scales, and it made the things of the earth that we bought and or like grew and stuff cost a lot, like the times we're going through right now, a global economical collapse. And they said after that was a rider of a pale horse, which was famine, death, hunger, disease, all the stuff that follows, you know, an economical collapse. And, uh, after that is the, it's a part they call the seal of the martyrs, where I believe is coming soon, where they kill people that are talking about these events and warning other people and trying to get the awaken and trying to get people to unite and revolt and at least awaken and trying to, you know, come together in some way against this, you know, shadowy empire, <laughs> you know, basically anything that's, it's, it's, we're being, you know, subjugated, like I said. And the martyrs get killed, basically, for warning of these events, okay? Six seal, and if you do look at the charts and stuff, I believe five and a half, six days, about six days after Passover, 2017, we'll be in the first meteor shower, just by the charts and everything that's going on, and uh, through the debris trail the first time. And that's the beginning of the 1,260 days me and you discussed earlier um, in the last video, too. Uh, the seventh seal is, it just, you read it for the verse for verse, but it, it talks about, you know, this stuff. And, uh, you could see 
the whole last video I did, that is the verses covered there. So that was that whole video we did is just that verse. <laughs> 8 through 13. And we actually forgot to touch on the fact that uh, Nibiru grows wings, you know, appears to have wings and placed in the back of Virgo's neck. So she has, you know, would sprout wings. And anybody that's an amateur astronomer would know when a comet or an object passes through between Jupiter and Mars, where they're saying this thing would go. No, let me pull this down a little bit. Jupiter and Mars. Okay, let's look at it from this view. Jupiter and Mars, where the asteroid belt is, where they said it came before, and where we have evidence it has been. When it comes between there, it grows a tail, a coma. That's what we call it, a coma. And an object that big would have two of them, you know, it'd be coming off both sides like Hayachi's hair on Tekken, you know. <laughs> and uh, any objects with right. it, so I guess that's where it came from. Um, this is a pet picture of Babylon from above, Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, Saddam Hussein actually rebuilt his temple right here and this is the Tower of Babel right here and that was in the Bible too they said you know something about that tower being rebuilt you know would be a sign of the end times and then there you go uh, pretty pretty cool um, it actually talks about it being sunken in the Bible and it gives a description of how it was sunken into the earth and part of the tower remained there until the whole town fell and uh, if you, I got a close-up image of it here sorry right there and uh, just shows you if you look at it there's north straight up at the time you know people would uh, they'd build that you know north south east west you know we've seen that with the, the other temples this is called a ziggurat that's because that's what a temple is over there and yeah you can tell that there's about at least a 14 degree 15 degree tilt right there um, from straight up and down the Pac-Man mouth or whatever you'd say right here would or right here, whatever mm -hmm. side to do it on, about mm -hmm. 15 degrees. So that's another thing. Um, here's the Nebra Sky Disk. You guys can look this up on Wikipedia or anywhere. But uh, they found this, and it was actually looters found this. And they found it and sold it on the black market, and then it was finally turned over. So we would have never had this artifact had and somebody came clean about it. But uh, it shows their time the same version of an all sky cam that's why you get the orientation of the ground over here and the ground over here the sky lines and the ground see it's that little impression over here it's just like when we look at the ice all sky cam in a circular form because your look they were aware they were on a globe looking up so they gave the globe's perception looking up in reference to where they were with the ground and everything so there's the moon being partially you know and it give, looks there's an, there's one, two, three stars in between the moon and the sun. And they were saying it was being eclipsed there. They inlaid it with bronze and that. Um, there's a lot of information that we pulled out of that. But definitely a 28-degree polar shift from where the stars are now in correlation to anything. People even, you could even make like a far stretch. They'll be like, oh, they'll say like the constellation is um, something else. But if you go back and look at the solid facts, that the constellation actually would be a, they had a, closer straw they could have grasped that and they didn't realize it I guess so they're you know even the bunk explanations don't don't cut it you know <laughs> for it so there's definitely a polar shift that uh, shows this artifact and you can date it because it's bronzed and metal so they can date this right back to the second that that person you know poured that metal on there and dented it and played with it so yeah that's interesting neat. very interesting and um yeah, so anything well, else well, can go over. You know, and one thing I'd like to show you guys before we close out tonight, and I, I want to get your opinion on this, is first off, let me share some photos with you. Uh, you know, we'll keep it on the screen that it's at here. Just give me one moment. There you go. Okay, and can you see the screen that I'm sharing now? Yeah. Okay, now this is Jason, and he sent this out to me. I want to say thank you very much, Jason, because these are some of the best photos that I have personally ever seen for evidence of there being a second sun, uh, Planet X, whatever name you want to put to it. I think that these are pretty compelling. These are better than any of the ones that I've seen from a sky cam or you know, Soho imagery. These are pretty good. So thank you, Jason, for sending these out. I certainly hope you'll give us an opportunity to, uh, if you've got any more 
photos or video footage. I'm sure that you'll send those out to us. I hope so. And we'll definitely get those out to others here. Now, take a look at this one. Boom. Look at that. So now you see the reflection off of that second sun right there. Yeah. So I can definitely see the one is an anomaly to the left. I think that's lens flare, obviously, or a reflection. Well, they're both or... there. See, see the one below it and the one above it? That is mm -hmm. actually both reflections of both objects. So both of them are giving hot, uh, they're actually giving off heat. So you could turn the gamma down, both those on the left would disappear and both the right would stay. Yeah, that's definitely a hot object. Bingo. Not... Okay, so now let's go to the next one here. I'm going <coughs> to pull this one up. Boom. Look at that. See the double. See the double again? Yep. And how they correlate with where they are? They're yep. both giving off heat. So if you turn down the gamma, the, the reflection would disappear and the real thing would stay. That's how you eliminate lens flare. Anybody that shows you a lens flare, just turn the gamma up and down. If it goes away, it's, it's cold reflection and it's light reflecting off an object, not get emitting from an object. Okay. So... You know, once again, Jason, accolades to you, my friend. That is a very good photo right there. What uh, hemisphere is he in? Uh, he's, in he's in California. California. Yeah, that's look at that. Very New, interesting. Uh, Mather, cool. California. Here's the date, August 18th, 2015. There's your location, ladies and gentlemen. If you can do an orbit or tracking or whatever you need to do to figure out where it is now, there's yeah. your reference point, August 18th, 2015. That's a very good, because uh, make sure you guys... Uh, Mark in the elevation and the latitude and longitude. Here's of the twenty. Where he's at. Here's the twenty second. Yep. Here's the twenty second of August. Take a look at that one. Boom! Look at that. Yep. And both the objects are there again. So yeah, that's uh, he's showing you real stuff there. Some pretty good swamp gas. I'm telling you. Well, you can't like I showed you with the gamma. It's just you can't turn down gamma. Now, <laughs> obviously, yeah. Now, this right here, you know, a lot of people will send me pictures, and I appreciate it, and I'll get these pictures where you can see this, like, aura, this reddish aura, and you'll see something in the middle of it, and you'll think, wow, that looks like the, the winged destroyer. That looks like Planet X for sure. That's got the same telltale signs. No, that's, that's a reflection. Yeah, the big, the big part's actually, yeah, it's a reflection because you're looking through it through a, a curved piece of glass. But look at this. Look at this. Dual reflections, once again. Exactly. See That's that? how you tell. I'm telling That's you. Exactly how you tell. Those are some cool clay pigeons right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, there actually is a lot of information in that uh, big reflection, but that's only to do with the angle of the camera and stuff like that with the sun. It's just, you know, kind of ways to tell if something was faked, really, with the reflection. This is there is information window. in it. That's all. What do you think of this one? That looks pretty neat. Okay. That's, why is it so... Uh, why is it misshapen like that? Is that... Well, I see, you know, I mean, obviously you got your son right here. I think this might be... Oh, yeah. Setting right there. Overexposed picture, yeah, I see. And then, so this is an interesting one. I think this is a little different here. This is like just some type of chemtrail clouds that he sent out. And then I'm yeah, not but sure. see how the exposure on the cameras like that? Mm -hmm. That's what they're doing with the chemtrails, I believe. It's called photoionization, and everybody can look that up. Okay. That's why you only see them going towards the sun. It only works going towards the sun. The sun activates it. And if you make a grid pattern, you got to learn about um, catalysts. Anybody knows anything about catalysts, that's why they do a grid pattern. Yeah, the grid patterns are very popular with them. Now, this one is the 22nd again. And here you go. you got your dual. Look at that, man. That's Tell awesome. Man. Yeah. It's, uh, it's almost like Star Wars had it, you know, you know. Oh, yeah. Programmed all those years ago. Mm -hmm. Pre programmed, absolutely. So then you got this guy right here. You got the dual. And that goes with uh, where it should be. It should be to the right of the sun in the northern hemisphere. That's uh, about this time of year, anyways, not in August. That's what I was saying. That uh, correlates with all my findings, anyways. Now, okay. And then, so this is, it looks like he did some different types of. You know, look at that. It's got a mono, tonal, chrome, fade. That's on that cloud that we were looking at. The weird. Yeah, that's definitely hiding something. That's weird. I've never seen a cloud. Uh, I don't know. So, I don't know. It's just weird. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like it was pastel, with, like stretched across there. Yeah, I mean, that's very odd. He gets some good photos, and he lives in California, huh? Yeah, and yeah, just some, some great must shots. Must be high up in elevation. 
I bet you that's that's I think that's have to do with it. Like when you're up or higher, you just the atmosphere is thinner, so they can't block as much. This, like you said, this reminds me of the original Star Wars. Came out in what 1977. Exactly. The year I was born. You know, I must be a Star Wars fan because my mom watched that movie the day before I was born, and then I've just been a, a big fan of Star awesome. Wars ever since. You know, I mean, so yeah. it's pretty cool. So. I'll tell you, man, this has been great to speak with you, Jace. I'm really glad you came on with us. You shared some just awesome information, and hopefully we can have the opportunity to do this again soon. If you want to put some other great gems together for us, that'd be yeah, absolutely I'll, fantastic. I'm going to continuously work on what I can and, you know, uh, prove us wrong, guys. I, I'd like to see somebody prove me wrong, and hopefully this is a fake, but uh, it's not looking that way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, and, and once again, even with that said, I'm not the guy that's going to go, well, I think we need to go you know, head for the bunkers and, and be prepared because no. I still think you we're going to be, be here. Prepared. You should always be prepared for an event. That's all. That's yeah. just, if you care about your family and your life, then you should be prepared for events that could happen. Like have a bug out bag. That's all. Don't. We're not trying to sell anything. We're not sitting here saying sell in survival gear. You know what I mean? It's just, you know, be prepared and for anything. That, that, that being said, you know, <laughs> that's not uh, – that could be in the best of times, you know? Well, if you're going to go out, I mean, think of how much money you spend on car insurance, health insurance, dental insurance, life insurance, supplemental insurance, I mean, thousands and thousands of dollars a year. And then typically today, most people don't even carry cash around, maybe 10, 20 bucks, because most of their money's in, you know, they're going to swipe their debit card or credit card or whatever to pay for things. So if there is a glitch, if a virus goes out in the bank computer systems, if you know there's a solar flare that's really big that causes some satellites to go offline, there's so many different things that could happen. Why not be prepared? Have yourselves maybe a, a three-month supply of food and water or at least a couple of weeks or at least yeah. a week or something like that and a couple of weeks and just to, or skills you know maybe have just grow a garden you know what i mean things like that uh learn how to can and pot foods and meat like that you can pot meats and stuff like that pot deer meat every once in a while and that's like delicious you know you oh, can yeah. freezer forever and just things like that think ahead things that you can save um i mean if you grow it in your yard and put it in your freezer that's not costing you a thing just a little bit of time and I mean, what's that, you know? What what comes the worst if you have a good spaghetti that night, you know? Oh, well, you know, we prepared you to have a good dinner one night. <laughs> Damn you. Know? You. you yeah. know, and we, we had John Michael Greer on with us a while back. He's a very well-educated, um, he's, he's an excellent author. He's written over 20 books, philosopher. He's also, I think, the the master arch druid for the Golden Dawn. You know, he's, he's a very intelligent person, and he thinks that the civilization right now that we're in is slowly going to decline for the next 100 years. 100 years from now, it's going to be a lot more primitive, a lot less electronics-type stuff, but eventually it will turn back around. But he just thinks it's going to be a real long, slow process. Um, but he said, you know what, Rex? He said, instead of being one of those guys that goes out and puts together a year's supply of food and water and, you know, builds uh, this just incredible bunker system where they've got these containers that are underground that they set up with tons of food and water and supplies. Don't be that guy. Be, be the dude that knows how to make beer. Yeah. You know, because if you can make good beer when uh, if, if shit does hit the fan and people need, you know, you're going to have warlords and these gang members and stuff that are just ruthless, and they can pretty easily break into some people's houses sometimes yeah. if they can overthrow them. But if you know how to make good beer, they'll let you do your thing. Hey, man, just make them a good L here and there. Have a skill, exactly. Have a skill. And even if it's, like, just something minor like that, you know, like making beer or whatever, you know, you could just literally use it like i was thinking uh people are like oh well i want to save money and you're telling us not to save money and you know that's not stimulating the economy and this and that they need to understand that it's all borrowed fake money and it's none of it's really there anyways and if you do want to be smart and save money and invest in things buy things like uh 
precious metals that you, you really need to rebuild society, like silver and gold. You know, those things are very precious in electronics and everything else in the world, and their value will never go down. You want to get a hold of some big job. Let me tie, let me, you know, just for. If you for, had extra money, is what I'm saying, you know, for people that want to do invest. Unless you, know? you got a well, whole bunch of money, though, Jason, and, and I'm, I'm not trying to interrupt, man, but as far as the gold and silver thing goes, I, I have a little you don't bit have of. The money, don't buy it, exactly. A different opinion on that. I mean, you need, okay, do you really need bars of gold and silver? No, and no. You, what I'm saying is that those things are going to be precious. No matter what, especially if mm -hmm. in the case of like a, a material, electromagnetic pulse or something where it fries and melts circuitry, you know what I mean? Like, who knows stuff? how to make that stuff though? They're all in China. Oh, I understand that. You know I, what I mean? I, I mean, if, if you got all this gold and precious. silver and you're like, hey guys, I got bars of gold and silver, well, they're, you know, well, I've got food and I've got real estate and I've got assets and I can protect myself. I mean, gold and silver, don't get me wrong. I can understand having, if you want a few rounds or something, or if you've got lots of money and you want to diversify your assets, I totally get it. But if you're the, the common folk, individuals, and when you say that, exactly. but that money doesn't have any value, yeah, it does. I mean, I mean, I've heard that before too, but it's got plenty of value. I'd rather have $1,000 in cash than $1,000 in gold because if things do hit the fan, I'm going to be able to spend that 1000 bucks cash a lot quicker than that gold. You know, it's like, people could be like, I don't want your gold, man. What am I going to do with this? How do I know that's real gold? I don't know how to look for real gold, but if you got cash, they'll take that and you'll be able to, you know, obviously if things are so bad that you can't use cash to buy stuff, do you really think people are going to want to barter for, for gold and silver? It would be like a weakened infrastructure, you know what I mean? I don't think it's like cataclysmic like you said, I, I believe that we're going to survive it. And a lot of people will be in some bad shape, you know, and there's going to be a lot of stuff because we're so dependent on things like that. But like I said, this doesn't mean it's world ending, you know what I mean? Like, like the, the transitions, not, you know what I mean? I think the money worth is like setting up for a failure and it's just going to collapse. You know, like I said, the, when I mean money don't have worth, it's as I'm saying, it's it's a binary electronic number in a computer is all I meant. You know, like you're saying, swiping the card, that's all I meant. It used to actually be backed by a product, and now it's not. You know, well, it's a note. In so. in America, yeah, but you look at countries like Germany when they were they almost they were bankrupt. They were a bankrupt nation, and it took wheelbarrows of cash to buy a loaf of bread at one point. Yeah. So Hitler goes out and says, "Okay, well, you know what we're going to do? We're not going to pay these offshore interest anymore. We're going to create our own money, and we're going to back it based upon services, not not metals." And then that way they can say, okay, well, this value is equal to X amount of hours or that much man service. You can put whatever you want to back socialism a currency. Socialism is like a cool idea. When not it comes socialism. To no, 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 no. No, when no. you're labeling it like that. I not, mean, yeah. not socialism. No, we're talking, you create, you can create money and back it with anything you want. The money is going to be backed upon people that care about that money or it's, it's the economy. It's the people behind it. So, you know, I mean, I remember when Max Kaiser. Hold on a second. I remember when Max Kaiser, this kind of pissed me off a few years ago. He was like, oh, man, take your dollars and throw them out in the, in the streets because they're not worth anything. And no, the bankers like would freak out if you did that. And I'm thinking, give me a break, man. Go ahead and throw your dollars my way because it's worth something. And people yeah. like you and me, Jason, it's people like you and me and others out there that keep the dollar strong. If we believe exactly. in it and if we're still spending our monies – then there's going to be a good chance until these elite aristocrats that do have enough power to pull the strings, at least until then, we can keep the economy propped up. But like you said, have some assets and diversify. Don't put everything in one basket. But if you got ten grand in the bank, I wouldn't recommend going out and spending half of that on gold and silver. No, you know, exactly. put, it, put, it, put it somewhere. And most people don't have ten grand in the bank. No, I, you know I, I, I mean? get that. I'm saying the, the, there's people that are saying, you know, like, I, I, I want to have a future and they have all this money and they want to invest. Like, they're talking about a lot of money. It's like, well, buy, if you're going to talk about that, like, you could, you could, like you said, diversify. You could buy something that's going to be valuable. You know what I mean? Whatever it, your prediction may be. You know what I mean? I just said silver and gold because, you know, gold may be hard to get a hold of. Silver may be easier to get a hold of, you know? I was just saying that as an aspect to look at. But, yeah, hyperinflation basically like you're saying with germany and all that that that's happening in venezuela right now you know mm -hmm. you need like eleven thousand of their dollars to go eat lunch you know <laughs> it's, it's crazy you know they're actually their menu prices right now have just blank labels over them because they have to write them in every day because the money changes every day that fast so Jeez. like it's it's ridiculous and i mean i, I 
don't get me wrong. Like I said, I understand that, but I don't believe in a federal banking system. I believe that we should back our own money, like you said, with our own source. Because when you're loaning out money on a like a 25 percent interest, that means just say you're a country, you're Rex country and uh, Rextopia, and you want to make a dollar on the federal bank. Okay, here's a dollar. You owe me a dollar twenty-five, but there's only a dollar twenty or dollar in existence. So you right. always owe me a dollar twenty-five. You know what I mean? Right. You owe me that twenty-five cents. It's and the ultimate Ponzi scheme. that extra quarter, you're getting another 25% interest, and you're really just getting fed into the trap more and more, you know, because you got interest on top of money that was already interest. You, well, know? you know, and that's how they take over small countries. Exactly. And um, I, who was the gentleman that we had on our show that actually used to be an economic hitman, and he would go out and get countries to sign over their land, their assets, and everything so that these guys could go. John Perkins. John Perkins, he wrote a book called um, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, and this guy literally worked for the system. He would meet kings and, and queens of certain countries. He would meet these you know, dictators, and basically he would sell them on letting the U.S. go in with their contractors and build roads and nuclear reactors and infrastructure, and few people would really profit big time from it, and they would promise everybody would. And they, if the, the person that ruled that country, whether this was an emperor or a king or anybody, if they didn't play ball, guess what would happen next? More. Well, that send in hit teams. Oh, yeah. And guess what happens if the hit teams didn't win, didn't get them? What's that? They send in the military. Yeah, exactly. Roll in with war. That's what I figured. That's, that's like what was going on like right before 2001. You look, uh, we had like... Sudan, Libya, Cuba, North Korea, Iran, uh, or Iraq. Yeah, no, Iran and uh, Afghanistan. None of them had a Federal Reserve. Now that list is Cuba and North Korea. Okay, and uh, what are we talking about doing now? We're being buddy buddy with Cuba, and we hate North Korea because they will not side. What they're not going to give their money. He's not going to make a Federal Reserve deal. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He just will not do it. And everybody looks at him and paints him as a bad guy. Yes, he's a crazy little man, but you got to remember who Did, controls the media. I usually don't have an opportunity to interject as much with people I talk to, but you're, you're really kind of my, – my brain's going a million miles right now, and you're really bringing up some good things that I want to discuss with you. So a moment ago when we were talking about the gold and silver, I certainly wasn't getting on your case or anything. I just feel that that's one of those things that people uh, – that many of those out there that really have – super good intentions, but they don't have a whole lot of money and they're looking for ways to spend it. I kind of feel like they get trapped into that thinking you got to go spend it on gold and silver when in reality, if things hit the fan, it's probably not going to have a whole lot of tangible, you know, assets to you at that specific time. But, you know, once yeah. again, diversify. And if you got the money to spend, hey, right on. I'm not telling you what to spend your money on in any way, shape or form. I mean, seriously, watch these guys. Do you remember back when they had the, the big scare when, oh, Kim Jong-un is going to send these nuclear missiles in California. And he was he was with all his generals, which look like they're about ready to go to some freaking retirement home. I mean, yeah. you know, don't they? They look like they need yeah. oxygen and a walker. They're about 80 years old, right? And they're all, they're all standing by him going, oh, yes, we love you, Kim. We love you. And he, he's... Fiery storm to Washington. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> do you, I mean, okay, so, okay, they're going to show us what they're going to do, right? They're going to show us on this big poster. Oh, we're going to blow you up there, 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 and there. We're going to send yeah. missiles that way because we don't know that you have satellites and laser systems and, and, and cutting technologies that's way superior to ours. So we're going to let you know where we're going to send these missiles out beforehand. And yeah. then you see him out on the beach hanging out with his general buddies, and there's nobody else around him but his general friends, and it'd be so easy to send a drone strike in there or something like that. Just boom! Just take him out him, yeah. immediately. <laughs> And yet this guy is just hanging out with his buddies, having fun, and, oh, this is where we're going to nuke you. Whether or not the guy is an actor, in my opinion, North Korea is in no way, shape, or form a threat. And almost, in my opinion, they're setting that up in, in scenes like the movie Wag the Dog. They are. That's why. That's exactly what I was saying. They're trying to get us to back that so they can in, enforce the, like, just allow somebody to basically attack them and have us sanction it, have the American people and the people of the world say, yeah, that was justified. We, and then they're taken over, we give them a government, and then they're all of a sudden a part of the world Federal Reserve. That's why we're being buddy-buddy with Cuba. And then everybody in the world will have their money 
ran through the Rothschilds banking system. That well, there's only two countries, and it's North Korea and Cuba. And I mean, watch the news; you'll see, <laughs> you'll see which two countries will come up now. You know. So it's a, they've got it set up in Iran now. Then. Yeah, it's. It, I believe that Iran already has it uh, set up because the, they were. That was why we invaded. They wanted to go switch it from the euro. They already had the petrodollar, and that's why they still call it the petrodollar because they didn't actually officially switch it to the euro or anything. So. Uh, yeah, oil is still traded with the American dollar, so yeah, they're they're still part of it, you know. Hmm. Well, and they've been saying for four years now that the U.S. dollar isn't going to be able to purchase goods and fuel from other countries, and it's it certainly doesn't seem like it's affected us here at home enough to, you know, at least me anyway, or many people that I know. I mean, for most part, the economy right now is doing pretty good. It's not yeah, doing it's great. Stable. But it's doing fair. I believe the where they get a lot of the the money making is from the stock markets and these events that they already have staged because they know where the money to go and things like that. They can basically just you know make a prediction based on what they know is going to happen and make money. You know, and like I said, it's the money is the faith you put into it. But uh, they understand it a little bit more complexly than we do because of the interests and the deals and everything. They just they do understand it, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a way to get people to, you know, put, pour your heart and soul into something and not have as much as you would have, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, if you put it that way. You know, because I remember things before this whole, you know, 2001 thing, it was, you know, sl I mean, gas prices went up and then everything else goes up because it takes gas to get everything everywhere, you know what I mean? And I just felt like that was the surefire way to manipulate the market was through gasoline prices, you know. And even if it's just shaving numbers here and there and it's not really hurting us to where we're homeless or this and that or we just, you know, we don't go out to eat as much and things like that. Like you're saying, it's not like really hurting our pockets that much, you know what I mean? It, it's still there. It's like when, when, when some one place is doing really good and its neighbor's doing really bad, but they're both like honest, hardworking people. That's a pretty good sign that something's wrong, especially if it's like a whole country. You know what I mean? And that's all over the globe. You know? So, I mean, it doesn't take geniuses to figure out that we need change. But I don't think it's like a one world government with a bunch of evil dictators, you know, pulling the strings. You know what I mean? And maybe a global money system would be like a a nice idea if everybody still got to keep their own money systems you know like you could buy into walmart bucks or whatever this international dollar would be you know what i mean but you could still keep your own money you know your monetary your country's value you know what i mean just like buying tokens or something online or you know e-coins or whatever you know what i mean or a gift card it'd be the same idea why why couldn't you do that if you wanted to trade just trade it into a, you know a unit that's universal you could keep your own money and just have an exchange rate that's all you know makes sense to me i don't know sure i mean there's there's so many cool possibilities i know that there's a gentleman that's trying to get me to interview somebody from the venus project which is a resource-based economy and you know there, there's so many different possibilities and opportunities sense. i like that idea i really do like um people call it, like i said people call it socialism that's so i know that's like just the label like when you're <laughs> I don't consider it that. Like, you're working in exchange for a good. You know what I mean? You get this much, you know, you get the, you're allowed these comforts, this home, this much vehicle, you know, this much amenities for this type of job. And if you want to take on more responsibilities, you can get more comforts, but it's going to take more work and responsibility. But then they say that, like, uh, takes away creativity. And, it does. And, I mean, you know, how do you decide how try, much try time... More. Well, right. I mean, how do you decide how much time equals what? You know, you take an hour of shoveling snow versus an hour of giving a presentation in front of 50 people about how to save money on car insurance. I mean, I, heck, I don't know. I mean, what, what do you, how do you justify that? You know what I mean? So I think that money is... Calories. Is a, Calories burnt. <laughs> <laughs> right. Money's, I think money's good, you know? I mean, it's, it's good to have money in exchange and yes. there's nothing wrong with credit cards and, and debit cards and ATM machines. And I think that's all good. It's just like, where do you draw the line? I mean, if there's people out there that have a trillion dollars, why do you give them 
or a billion dollars or a hundred million dollars? Why do you give them more tax breaks than somebody that makes twenty-five dollars an hour or fifteen dollars an hour? Just you know, I mean, shouldn't there be some kind of balance there as well for the middle class? Because the middle class used to keep this country propped up so much, yet now it seems whoever's running th- things behind the scenes really wants to do away with the middle class and have this dystopia type society. Yeah, they don't. They want a vast, you know, basically just a vast leap between the money and that they them have it all, and then give us the little trickle that you know they yeah. want us to have. And they're the ones making the rules and the laws. You know, it's the ones that are in the position of power, are like the the less uh, less deserving and the least deserving of it. You know, the most humble, hard working person probably knows you know what the working hard working you know person needs and would want, you know, like free health care, things like that. <laughs> you know, Excuse me, sir, may I have another? You know, you think about like the, you just look at the countries with free health care and stuff like that and how their problems are reduced, you know, it's taking care of their taxes and things like that. And then the doctors aren't making millions and people aren't sick, you know. <laughs> you know, I, it's just the crime goes down. All of it is, I don't know, the more comfortable people are, the less, you know, civil unrest, I guess. Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with making millions, especially if you put 10 years of your life into college exactly. and spend $200,000 for an education. I'm not you know. talking bad about that. I, I'm saying a lot of the doctors like will buy MRIs and x-ray machines and stuff like that and then charge the hospitals every time they use it and then pay for that thing like 10 times over. Mm-hmm. And, you know, instead of why mm-hmm. wouldn't you, all right, just buy that maybe when you break even, you know, donate it to the hospital. <laughs> You know, like break even, go ahead, charge the hospital till you make your money back, you know, that, you know, you still donated your money to get them the object, you know, that'd be great, you know, but I don't know. I feel like there's a person in my town, a doctor that just wrote to the newspaper and took like a Supreme Court hearing in about uh, the Ten Commandments being out front of the courthouse downtown. And this is um, historic Cumberland. It was actually George Washington set up the courthouse down here in um, after the war, they were all beat up, and it was uh, before like D.C. and all that was built. He uh, had his lodge here, and uh, this was like the capital at the time, you know, before D.C. And they're going to go and change that courthouse and take down the, the Ten Commandments, you know, because he wants to be whatever. But he was a doctor, and I felt like because he was educated and, you know, versed and thought he could, uh, you know, say things about the Constitution, he was basically just going to be a dick and make problems and make that an issue when it's not an issue when there's he's got a lot of money there's people starving all kinds of real issues and he's worried about that you know our area has a drug problem caused by the doctors writing out prescriptions and stuff like that you know because we have a lot of bad doctors in the area that just do that they make money off pain management and you know people junkies in the area basically you know wanting their pills so and i mean it's a huge problem in my area like i said and I just don't agree with that aspect. Yes, there's a lot of good doctors and things like that. But, what you know, like you said, where do you draw the line? Where are you going to stop being corrupt? What are you going to become, you know, when you make all this money? <laughs> well, and yeah. even the doctors out there, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because many of them are supposed to be so smart. Yet, if you present very solid, tangible evidence that what they have been taught isn't correct, they go into this disconnect mode and they have to stick up for what they've been taught, not only because of the conditioning process that they went through to get that position, you know, like residency and just yeah. the hundreds and hundreds, if not th- thousands of hours that they've gone Drilled through with indoctrination. So they're under the, one of the most amazing forms of mind control. And, you know, I don't know if that was by design. Yet you've got very few people out there that use their brains that are doctors to think outside of the box. And it's the pharmaceutical companies, in my opinion, that have taken the majority control of the industry. The pharmaceutical companies and these insurance companies that make people sicker and give them these sweet pills of poison, little band-aid effects and create more problems down the road to continue to sell them more products and, and bring a, a, a shorter lifespan to many people. Yeah, it's like uh, the religions destroy spirituality, uh, the hospitals destroy health, and you can pretty much, like, the government destroys, you know, freedoms. So you can pretty much uh, realize that we're in backwards times, and it's not a genius. It doesn't take a genius to figure this out, you know. This is... It's sad times we're in, and it's time to be the change that America. we want to see. America. Land of the free. 
but yeah, see, that's that's exactly what it was. See, Iran wanted to, they wanted to not be a part of the Federal Reserve, so they called them terrorists and multiple other reasons behind 9-11, um, you know, because the building needed to go and things like that, insurance money, things like that. They made a lot of profit off of it, and it was a false flag attempt to get us to say America, freedom, you know. And then you could honestly say around 2001, just about everybody in America just did not like the Middle East. You know, you were almost like subject, subjected to profile these people because of uh, the news and like the conditioning. And I was in like uh, seventh grade, man, you know, and they they literally draw, brought the TVs in at around 9 a.m. and forced us to watch that stuff all day on the news. We didn't have class. We watched 9-11 on the news live, you know. And, oh, they programmed you with that during school, yeah, huh? Think about it, man. And Wonderful. then one of the kids said something about, uh, our school's next. Don't tell anybody. And that kid was suspended for 10 days for writing that on a letter, just kidding to his buddy next to him. Somebody was being a dick and just said, oh, you know, he wrote this on a letter. And they, they literally expelled that kid for 10 days out of school. It was like the craziest stuff I've seen. I was, you know, I was there. Like I said, they, the mental subjugation. Then the next year, you'd see kids with T-shirts that had like, an American soldier holding up like a beaten Taliban corpse or something, you know, like in a cartoon form on the back of their shirt, saying some kind of American slogan and stuff. You've seen it everywhere. And, and it now deceptive. it's the exact opposite. Now, if you have an American flag on and you are in high school in California, they'll make you go home. Yeah, that's in the Bible, too. They predicted this big Muslim Christian war, you know. And uh, then you go back to the Robert Peck paper, whatever it was, that Illuminati you know, stonemason paper where he, you know, proposed uh, whatever it was. Basically gave, like, Albert Pike, the plans. 33rd degree Freemason. Yeah, Albert Pike, there you go. He even said that stuff. I mean, he was, he, he was really adamant about, you know, you know, state of Islam and Muslims and Christians, like, kind of just destroying each other, you know what <laughs> I mean? Like, having a, that's what, you, you can see it both ways. Like I said, they, they incite the war, you know. Like the Jews, the, the Jews and um, the Muslims and all that, they're fighting over the, you know, their little promised land, their homeland. You know, like what people don't understand is, all right, like the Muslims' most holy site is built on top of, you know, the Hebrews, the most, their most, the Jewish people's most holy site, you know. And for the Jewish prophecy to come true, the, the Muslim place basically has to be leveled and destroyed. For their prophecy to come true and for them to go back to their homeland and have it, you know. So, like, their shrine, that big Mecca, that cube or whatever, would literally, ha like, and all that would have to be, like, gone and annihilated for the, the their prophecy to be fulfilled, man. And that's pretty, uh, pretty wild stuff. You, you can look at it both ways, like, both aspects, like, uh, if you get into it deep. But a lot of people don't know that, you know. There's literally just kind of... For whatever religion to be right, it all bases on their, you know, the homeland and who has it last, I guess. And it's kind of strange that it's all coming down to that.